the occipital bone. The purpose of this video is to present most important features of the occipital bone. So what I suggest is that we start first by taking a look at it being a part of the entire skull or better to say being part of the cranial compartment. The cranium is composed of six bones that are externally visible. So going from front to back, the frontal bone, then we would have left and right sided parietal bone, left and right sided temporal bone, and of course at the very back, the occipital bone. Other two bones that could be seen only when we take a look at the base of the skull when the skull cap becomes removed are the sphenoid and the ethmoid bone. So let me rotate first this skull in order to show what occipital bone would look from behind. And first what we see here is a big and massive suture that it is involved when it connects with two parietal bones. The suture itself is called the lambdoid suture and of course the name is given after its resemblance to Greek letter lambda. When we rotate the skull to see the full extent of the occipital bone, perhaps it becomes a little bit of a surprise how actually this bone is large. What usually makes a little bit of a difference between observing the occipital bone of the skull and trying to figure it out on the basis of a head of a living person is that we're unable to ev evaluate where exactly the spinal column is and how much of this massive overhang that occipital bone makes is actually filled up in a living person with muscles. So skull from time to time becomes truly a surprise. I do have here an individual occipital bone which corresponds with its principal size to the skull that I have in my hand. So I will just briefly superimpose it in order to get a little bit of idea as what we're going to be looking at. So here we are. We're looking now at the isolated occipital bone. Its largest part, which is in front of you now, is known as the squama of the occipital bone. Should I continue rotating it as what I have done earlier with the entire skull, we would be able to identify perhaps the largest and definitely landmark that is impossible to miss, the foramen magnum of the occipital bone. Further lateral to foramen magnum of the occipital bone, we would have left and right sided lateral parts of the bone, which continue together with the squama to circumscribe the foramen magnum. And then what is the last part, which is found further anterior to foramen magnum, is what is called the basilar part of the occipital bone. On the squama itself, there would be quite a large number of different landmarks. And as we go again from the most superior part, let's identify one more time that this irregular, highly serrated edge is what forms the lambdoid suture between the occipital bone and left and right sided parietal bones. Then we're going to have quite massive bony protuberance, which is called the external occipital protuberance. One of the findings that is quite easy and simple to find on the head of a living person through very quick palpation. What goes away from external occipital protuberance are two quite massive bony ridges. They are known as the superior neuhal lines. They actually mark the most superior edge to which muscles of the neck will reach when they finally attach on the occipital bones squama. Further inferiorly, and it is a little bit less visible, we would also have another paired bony ridges, this time being known as the inferior Newhall lines. So superior Newhall lines, inferior Newhall lines, external occipital protuberance. If we take a look from the inner, ass, inner side of the occipital bones squama, we'll find even more interesting details. So what is here is what is called the internal occipital protuberance, but also in some textbooks people prefer to call that area as the confluence of sinuses. 
Now we can see that certain grooves appear to converge on internal occipital protuberance and what we have here are a couple of grooves literally being carved by dural sinuses. So this is a groove of a superior sagittal sinus and at this point here, internal occipital protuberance, it receives even more blood through other dural sinuses. So that is the reason for which it is called a confluence of sinuses. From here, blood cannot be directed through another sulcus or another groove continuing through the midline, but rather blood becomes diverted into left and right sided transverse dural sinuses and their impression is also quite well seen here on the inner table of the occipital bone. As the transverse sinus will reach here and hit into pyramidal part of the temporal bone, they would be forced to take another diversion and to become the sigmoid sinus that keeps moving in an inferior direction until they finally reach the opening which is the jugular foramen at the base of the skull. At that point the sigmoid sinus will quickly undergo another change and will become the internal jugular vein which exits the skull. The red color detail on the right side of the bone is practically one half of the jugular foramen because it is a joint venture between the occipital bone and the temporal bone. If we take a much closer look now around foramen magnum and we know that there are two lateral parts and the basilar part around it, the rest of it is the squama of the occipital bone, we will find out that on the lateral parts there is something also very important. What we have here practically converging in the anterior midline direction are condyles of the occipital bone. Condyles will be supported by the same name landmarks on the first cervical vertebra and at this point here Atlanta occipital joint will be formed between occipital bone and first cervical vertebra. Just above the condyle one can see this big opening and that is the exit point for cranial nerve number 12 from the skull that is called the hypoglossal canal that is cranial nerve number 12, the hypoglossal nerve and its very own canal to emerge it from the skull. Finally, as we're still looking at the inside of the occipital bone, with a few words we need to address this part, the basilar part of the occipital bone, which together with the body of the sphenoid forms part which is known as the clivus. Perhaps it would be way better to take a look at the base of the skull from the above and for the rest of this video we will use the skull with the skull cap removed but the entire base of the skull will be preserved. So here we are. Superior view to the base of the skull and of course frame and magnum which is in the center of the picture becomes a very good landmark for us to remember. I'll need to zoom in and to take a closer look at some of the features where occipital bone will be important to understand. After the spinal cord has entered the cranial cavity in order to become a brain stem, the brain stem leans slightly forward and for that reason the basilar part of the occipital bone is going to have a very major important role to support it and to create an environment which is not too harsh or too abrasive. The basilar part of the occipital bone practically will contact here and make a joint with the body of a sphenoid bone. This is the dorsum of the cella tersica, so this is pituitary fossa here, the dorsum of cella tersica. So this part combined body of the sphenoid and the basilar part is what is called the clivus. Using this skull we can also follow up and perhaps make it more obvious what happens with the dural sinuses and we're gonna start at this point here. This is internal occipital protuberance, the confluence of the sinuses. So superior sagittal sinus coming from the above is gonna meet sinus rectus 
and this is where the blood will be further split into two transverse sinuses, the left and right side of transverse sinus. I would need to move the camera now to a different location in order to continue with the rest of the transverse sinus. I will do it like this. So we can see here the transverse sinus continuing and going horizontally and at this point here it is making practically a physical impact against the petrous part of the temporal bone. So for that reason the sinus is going to be forced to divert inferiorly and at this point it leaves also a very deep depression which is known as the depression of sigmoid sinus. The sigmoid sinus ultimately reaches the opening that exists between temporal bone and petrous part, the temporal bone petrous part and the lateral part of occipital bone forming the opening known to us as the jugular foramen. Perhaps it's a little bit easier to see it on the other side and I will use this odd position of the skull to point out one more time. This is the transverse sinus. Here it becomes sigmoid sinus, a very deep groove is there and if we follow the sigmoid sinus we're gonna come straight forward to this opening that is the jugular foramen of the skull.